Hello and welcome to our brave conversation starter on today's topic of climate action. I'm Nurun Alahi and I attend Chittagong Grammar School in Bangladesh. And I'm Zoe Kirti from Thomas More College in South Africa. Over the past few weeks, students across the Round Square community have interviewed 14 keynote conversationists from different backgrounds and areas of expertise to find out where they think we should start our conversations today. Well, let's hear what our interviewers asked and what our speakers had to say about climate change. For 40 years, you've studied extreme climate change in remote polar regions. What changes have you observed in that time that we should be taking notice of? And why do they matter? If you ask a meteorologist, they say there's no such thing as uh, climate change or global warming, or they will say there is, but we always go into these periods of ice age, come out of ice age or a mini ice age. So they will say, that's just the norm. You know, we go in and out of these fluctuations with the temperature of the world. And I, and I of course, you have to agree with that because we've seen that and there's history uh, and, and data to, to prove that. So they are absolutely right. But my point, and I think a lot of people's point is, that sometimes happened over thousands of years, you know, thousands and thousands of years. But what I found in, in my life, I first went up to the Arctic Ocean in 1983. And from 1983 to now, there's one third less pack ice. And whereas before I could ski to the North Pole and did it, now it would be impossible to do. You would have to swim. You'd have to have an immersion suit to do it. And just to prove the point, very, very sadly to prove the point, a couple of years ago, uh, I sailed with a team around what they call the Northeast Passage, which was around the Russian uh, Arctic, and then the Northwest Passage, which is the Canadian and American Arctic, all within one season in a sailing boat. That, that before even 10 years ago would never have happened. And so before it would have taken years, each one. So that's, that's the extent of the decrease in the pack ice in the Arctic Ocean. And of course that's happening down in the South Antarctica. We're seeing big, big changes of the ice shelves and the glaciers down there and, and all the glaciers uh, retreating all around the world. And the problem with the Arctic and Antarctic, we use the analogy, it's like a canary in a, in a mine. And they used to use canaries in the mine because they would uh, topple over with a bit of sniff of uh, methane, which would kill miners. So they would take a, a canary down there. And that was the first alarm uh, that there was a problem. And that's the problem. The Arctic is the canary of climate change and so we're seeing this now drastic change up in the arctic and that really is alarm bells for the rest of the world because that 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 that's going to uh, reflect and impact on the rest of the world all of our actions leading to increased co2 emissions are leading to global warming warming is leading to sea level rise this is um, also to flooding, to you know, all of the disasters that we're seeing, forest fires in some places, unseasonal heat in other places, flooding in some places, freezing temperatures in other places, all of these impact health in, in one way uh, or the other. What are we going to do about the climate situation? Um, you know, what, how are we going to get to 1.5 degrees Celsius in this decade? You know, is it, if not, and how do we get to zero net zero emissions by 2050? Because this is, doesn't, you know, you don't show up at 2045 and say, we'll get in five years to get to zero emissions. And the hard truth there is the people talking about it are, are, are not necessarily responsible for it. You'll be responsible for it. I mean, look, this decade, yes, uh, it's on me and my generation and maybe we, you know, and, and, and we haven't done a good enough job. And hopefully we'll just get us, we won't get to the solution. We'll just get us to the right setup for the next gen to actually take it and go forward, right? So it's like a relay race, you know? Um, um, you you guys will be the anchor spinner. And in, in, in many instances, right, the fastest, the most strongest person is the anchor in the relay. 
Uh, but you're hoping that the start of the relay and the middle field of the relay actually have, run a pretty good pace because otherwise you're giving it all, you know, you're putting the entire burden on um, the anchor. By the way, I've seen some great races where the anchor has done an amazing thing, but that's not how a team works. So, you know, my my generation, our leg of it has to step up and we have a decade to do that, right? I'm, I'll be retired at the end of the decade. It'll be somebody else from 2030 to 40. But definitely, you'll be getting the baton at 2040 and racing in 2050. And that's one of those things where, you know, you have to have that brave conversation about what the hell are we going to do now? Because we're not going to solve it now. But how do we make sure that, you know, we, we have it set up um, for the, the, the next, you know, baton, you know, exchange to work out very well and that we're on the right pace? In raising the profile of issues relating to climate change, we've also raised anxiety levels about these issues. Now, what meaningful action can we all take to address eco-anxiety by tackling some of the issues and addressing them? The solutions are out there, Arissa. The solutions are out there. We, I've seen incredible technology. We do, like a lot of people think that in order to stop climate change, in order to change our lives, that we have to go backwards and start living in caves and stuff like that. No, there is the technology, um, you know, for electric cars, for hydrogen fuel cars. I've seen houses powered, solar powered, hydrogen powered, wind powered. We've got the technology there and we just have to eat a little less meat. You know, we um, have to uh, but be more organized with what we what we what we throw away be less wasteful you know 10 percent of green all greenhouse gases in the world is caused by food waste food waste we throw away 10 percent of all the food i mean we throw away so much food that it causes 10 percent of the greenhouse gases on our planet it's nuts how simple is that if we all were less wasteful with our food. That's not hard. We could all do that tomorrow and that would immediately cut down 10% of the greenhouse gases uh, on, on the planet. It's not that difficult. So the solutions are there. There is, there is a lot of tough things for us to take into our mind and it needs to be. I think it needs to be hard. I think we need to be scared so we can do this uh, as quickly as possible. But the solutions are there. We need to have a courageous conversation on who are the polluters. And the polluters should be paying. This was the origin of the UN framework on climate change. The polluters should pay, was the principle we adopted at Rio. And who is suffering? And how is climate injustice part of perpetuating this problem? And how do we get climate justice? And finally, this is my, my conversation with myself and with the soil and with the plants. We worry so much. We get into so much anxiety about what's the next thing humans can do. Yeah? But it is the human humorous that has brought us into this problem. Fossil fuels with a fossilized mind and a fossilized heart. We forgot to be compassionate. We forgot to think ecologically in terms of our relationships with other species and with the earth. So my courageous conversation, which is my guide to action, is earth care is the biggest climate action. That's what we need to do. I think one of the problems is the, the pragmatism of it all. Is It's all very well to say, right, you know, we don't want coal-fired um, power station, that's fine but we all like our electricity. We all like our showers. We all like the good life. We all like a quality of life. And that's, you know, it's balancing that. And, and of course, in the UK, uh, we, we enjoy a very high standard of living. And one of the things that we've done in the past, we've got rid of all our dirty industries and the States have done the same to a certain degree. Uh, so you, you, you're sending all the dirty industries, such as the shipbuilding and the steelmaking and all these indus heavy industries abroad. So we become clean. And then we start to criticize those nations for not being clean because we've given them all the industries. Uh, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a massive global problem. How do we get around that? 
And I think that the thing that I'm very encouraged about uh, is with COVID, you know, this, this has been a world pandemic and we've, we're working together and I think we're going to resolve this very quickly. And I think if we put the same amount of money into technology and the same amount of resource into this, we can show that it can be done. And it feels really daunting to have these authority figures who seem to have no bandwidth for what you need and for the fact that we now have to set the stage to make life livable, happy and safe for your generation. A lot of good things um, are helping, right? There's a lot of interesting technology that that is really going to be uh, uh, innovative and make life easier. Um, I think that, you know, that there's been a world hunger reduction in the last couple of years. So not as many people are hungry as before. There, there are good things that have happened. These things threaten to be eclipsed by climate change. Um, and I, I think the situation can be mitigated a lot uh, if we start now and we really use these 10 years, these next 10 years and take them really seriously. I think that for your generation, um, maybe rethink who you are. Who you are is the customer. You're not the kids, you're tomorrow's customer. And that customer is gonna demand certain goods, certain foods, certain types of packaging, you know, if, if people try to market a bunch of crap to you, you'll say, I'm not buying that. I'm the customer. And I think it's, it's, it's good for young people to start thinking about where their food comes from, what goes into their food and what action they can take, you know, to, to start being part of like the, you know, the, the green economy, like the green society. And as I, as I mentioned, we have seen so many, so many people go hungry um, you know, in the, in the middle of the pandemic, and we still are in the middle of a pandemic. And so I think young people should start thinking about ways to um, start um, food gardens, because gardens are very sustainable, um, you know, and also equip, you know, um, recipients of those gardens uh, with skills so that they can continue, you know, skills um, to, to, to manage the, the gardens on, on, on their own. I think young people should also question um, large corporations around um, what goes in into the, the products and and that that they're farming, that they're selling. You know, if you go into a grocery store, just look at the of the, the the product, look at the label, look at the ingredients in there. You know, list of things that that, that are there. And I think we need to start questioning. Um, and and one way is obviously making sure that. Um, the bee colony is, is, is growing all over the world. Bee colony stays healthy and our bees are not killed by pesticides. So I think that's one way where young people can, can get involved. Unless we are doing things on an ongoing basis that are consistent with our values and our beliefs, we're not really making an impact. So you, you as a young leader, you need to be asking yourself the decisions about your consumer, consuming, your consumerism, what companies are you supporting and what do they stand for? Your decisions about um, the, the way you eat, the decisions about the clothes you wear, the decisions about all of the things you do, where you go for holiday and all of those things. That's where you make an impact. And, and, and often it's, it's as much about what you do not do or what you do not support that actually makes more of an impact than what you you know what you do. It's important to recognize that your power is not just about voting for the next politician. You know, it's not just about kind of political activism. That that's one side of it. It's also about your power as um, customers. In in the capitalist world, and we are living again in the if it's the age of plural, extreme pluralism and extreme connectivity, we're also living in the age of extreme capitalism, and, and we need to shift that back to some some balance. But in the age of extreme capitalism, the customer is king. 
companies are all thinking about their consumers. Um, and you are the next generation of consumers and customers. One of the issues we will be talking about during our conference is the difference between activism and slacktivism. How to avoid tokenism and practice what we preach by actually making a meaningful and sustainable difference. What are your thoughts on this issue? We all know activism is about um, taking action uh, to move a certain goal forward uh, or ideas forward. Um, but I think we are living now in this era where because of the technology and because of social media, people think that just by posting something that they have done something. So I'll say, I'll say let's not discount selectivism. We need it. We need it too. <laughs> we need people to make noise. We need people to, uh, to use social media, to use their voices that they have um, to, to popularize the, the ideas and to challenge the status quo and all of that. Because in today's world, we, we're not all going to be standing on the street corners with placards and all of that. And sometimes, in some ways, standing on the street corners with placards does something, but there's just too much of it going on that often people don't even take notice anymore. It's like, oh, another protest, another protest, another protest. So even the actual activism in that way of being out in the streets and protesting it's just the same in some ways as selectivism because it's basically just making noise and saying we are not going to stand uh, you know for something or we're standing against something which is okay even myself i, I always wondered what is it like to go vi viral right what would it be like to be that person who posted that thing and then it happened to me you know uh, millions and millions of views on the Today Show and CNN and ABC World News. I mean, it's it's weird to be sitting in a green room with celebrities passing and you're sweating and worried about talking to Steve Harvey or some celebrity, uh, what they're going to say, what you're going to say. Is this moment going to ruin your entire life or change the trajectory for the next 50 years? You have no idea. But going through many of those moments... I can tell you this, a lot of it doesn't actually matter at all. Uh, and, and that may sound counterintuitive, but if you who is watching this right now are a person who wants to better this world in, in any way, or maybe change it entirely, I don't know. What I can say from a humanitarian perspective, from a charity, from an NGO's point of view, that I would have things go viral to literally the highest degree sometimes. And days later, you look back at those millions of views and you ask yourself, well, did this actually change anybody? Or is this just like a bunch of emotional entertainment? Did we just laugh and cry together for a moment and then just move on? Now, in my seat, the best way to, to answer that question, to look at it, is, is, is the same process anybody would do, which is, what was the last thing that you watched that went viral, that almost made you cry or made you laugh hysterically? Did you change anything about your behavior after watching that? Because you probably watched 10 of those things in the last two days, right? But did we do anything different after that? And, and to me, that is, is really the litmus test, the the view that shows me that sometimes social media doesn't do as much as we think it it does, it should. Human beings, you know, we like shiny lights. We like attention. I don't, you know, I can't say exactly why that is, but it distracts us from real impact and, and measuring what actually happened. Uh, it's human nature. I do it too. I fall victim to that. So we just kind of have to take a step back and, and realize that, that social media, it can do a lot, it has done a lot, it will do a lot, but a lot of it is also pretty empty in, in that sort of final, final uh, assessment. 
And we need to shift away from this because in the world of social media and, and, and you know, Twitter and Facebook and, and, and so forth, yeah, it's so easy to think that, that I just change my banner and I, or I put in my hashtag and that'll change the world. No, that's, that's awareness raising, right, to, to some extent. That's solidarity on its most minuscule level on, you know, and again, it's important if, if, if we want to sort of do trending of, of issues and so forth um, to, to raise the profile. But we have to be really conscious that awareness does not lead to action necessarily. In fact, often awareness, especially of big problems, leads to a sense of um, paralysis and a sense of inertia. And then a sense of, I can't do anything about this, so I'm just going to tune out and go off and do something else. Right. And, 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 and so we need, to, we need to be conscious of that. And, and from the standpoint of somebody who is an advocate or, or people who are conscious of, the, of, of what needs to be done, the challenge is, is to provide different ways in which people can become active. And I think with, with, between activism and slacktivism, we need to kind of shift the balance um, and, and then provide people with the opportunities to be genuinely engaged in, in activism and strategic activism um, to, to, to get the bigger picture uh, changes and paradigm shifts that we need. Slacktivism is, I wouldn't say it's a big issue in, in, in the world of making a more sustainable future. You know, if people are uh, trying to make a bigger difference, even if that's choosing easier ways to, to become an activist, as slacktivism is, I still think that's that's good. I think we should really be focusing on the people who who don't know how to make a difference or can't make a difference, um, and and trying to help them um, make make some sort of a difference. So we're all continually contributing um, to, to a better future. So often we get obsessed with that activism side that's so visual on social media, making these posts, changing our profile pic. And I'm not saying that awareness isn't a good thing. So, uh, you know, please don't take it that way. But if that's all we're doing is clicking a, a, a few buttons, taking a, a picture, changing a filter, right? Then, then we truly don't understand what, what it takes to change, to change this world. So this one is a big personal struggle. Um, it, a huge, huge personal struggle. One, because only now I'm sort of increasing even my use of things like social media. Um, and I think, I, I actually, let me answer it this way. I don't know when a tweet is enough versus when I have to go to the space where the buildings are being burnt down. I, I actually don't know. And I, yeah, I find this a very difficult topic. I do think there's definitely a continuum. There's selectivism, which is overt, complete ignoring of issues that are actually continuously being perpetuated and pretending like these things don't exist on this one end. And then on the other end, there's like, activism where basically at every protest at every march at every tweet at every you are there right part of it is when when people have this slacktivism slacktivism sort of angle on things they still have good intent right and we shouldn't discount them we shouldn't say oh that's a bad person just because they post things like i don't know about that right someone trying to raise awareness is is good intent it's just they may not be as educated on, on that particular subject. So I don't think we should look at people who are virtue signaling as a terrible thing. Maybe it's just the first step though, you know? It's like you, you gotta go, everybody's gotta go on a journey, everybody take a deep breath and relax here, right? And, and realize that that person may just not be there yet. So an interesting range of perspectives there from our speakers. They talked about eco-anxiety and how we might combat it through positive actions focusing on the things we can control and influence and working together more at a global level. Yeah, and I thought it was interesting that we had some different perspectives on whether we should take a step backwards and simplify our lives or if the challenge is to move forward and find innovative new solutions and viable alternatives. I think that deserves more discussion in our browser breakouts. And then we have the question of activism versus slacktivism. Is it enough to support a cause or campaign on social media, or is that a form of virtue signaling that isn't really achieving its aim? 
mixed views on that one from our speakers. So now we are going to move to our Baraza breakout rooms to pick up the conversations there. We hope you enjoyed watching the film and look forward to sharing the next one with you tomorrow.